Hi everybody! So today I wanted to continue the series of videos on optical mineralogy and today we're going to talk in depth about uh, isotropic materials. Just a brief recap of last time, uh, we made a polariscope and we used this polariscope uh, to determine two main groups of materials based on their optical properties. The isotropic materials are particularly boring if you recall from uh, the previous video. So they do not illustrate pleochroism under plain polarized light and are always extinct under cross polarized light, uh, not changing really with a rotation. So let's talk a little now about why that is. The reason isotropic materials and minerals display the optical properties that they do is because they are defined by having a single index of refraction. Put another way, the atomic structure of the mineral is uniform in all directions, and no matter how you look through the mineral, light will be traveling at the same speed. So if you recall from a physics class, the speed of light depends on the media through which it's traveling. The refractive index of a substance is then just the ratio of the speed of light in that substance to the ratio of the speed of light in air or, say, uh, in a vacuum. For our purposes, we'll compare to the speed of light in air, since all of our minerals will be surrounded by air. So this slide is just a little example of how uh, refraction works. Uh, so we have air with a refractive index of 1, so n equals 1, a spinel, which is a mineral we'll be seeing in a bit, with a refractive index of 1.718, and we have Snell's Law showing that the relationship between the angle A and angle B is going to be based on the relative ratio of the refractive index of air and spinel. So as I mentioned before, isotropic materials are defined by a single index of refraction. And because of that, being able to calculate that index of refraction is usually pretty helpful and, and very diagnostic in determining uh, a mineral's identity. So we can use our polariscope to determine that uh, a mineral is isotropic. However, uh, we can't really use it to determine the refractive index. For that, you need something like either a refractometer or a set of index oils. So I don't actually have those things, and I don't know what would be the best way to go about making a video uh, to illustrate that. So instead, let's talk about the two subclasses of materials that uh, comprise uh, isotropic substances. So as I mentioned before, the most important thing about our isotropic substances is that they're going to have a single index of refraction no matter how you look at them. And so this can occur either in minerals of the highest symmetry class, so the isometric crystal class, or in mineraloids and materials that are actually amorphous and not uh, true uh, minerals at all. So some common isotropic substances that are of the isometric crystal class include things such as fluorite, uh, garnet, halite, and spinel, as well as uh, more exotic things like diamonds. Mineraloids and uh, amorphous materials are, are pretty common. I mean, the most common of them being glass, which you can see pretty much everywhere. However, there is a caveat to isotropic materials uh, displaying isotropic behavior all the time. Uh, if you have a stress field actually in an isotropic material, it will cause it, in, in some instances, not to behave isotropically. Tempered glass is the most common example of this, and in fact, polariscopes can be used to sort of uh, visualize the stress within a, uh, a piece of tempered glass. So now that we have a new appreciation for why isotropic materials behave the way they do, let's take a look at a piece of spinel. So as light enters our piece of spinel, it's going to be refracted according to Snell's law. But because the mineral is isotropic, not really much else interesting is going to happen. Uh, so as you can see, once again, as we rotate in plain polarized light, uh, the spinel doesn't really change color, doesn't do much of anything. No pleochroism for you. So another important thing to note, if I didn't know this was an isotropic material already, you would also want to look at this through different orientations, just to make sure I wasn't accidentally looking down an optic axis. Uh, we'll talk about what an optic axis is more with uh, discussion on the anisotropic minerals next time. So now let's view our spinel under cross-polarized light and uh, see if anything interesting happens. If you've been paying attention, you know nothing interesting is going to happen.
Yep, that's uh, that's pretty boring there. Mm -hmm. And we'll rotate the mineral sum and look at it again. Um, but yes, it's still going to be very dark. So if there's anything that you take home from this video, it's that isotropic materials are defined by one index of refraction. And this singular index of refraction prevents the material from exhibiting pleochroism or transmission of light under cross-polarization. Another important point to remember is that if a material is isotropic, it is either going to be of the isometric crystal class or it is going to be an amorphous substance. Thanks for watching uh, this video and I hope you had fun learning about isotropic materials. Uh, I think next time we'll pick it up with talking about anisotropic materials in more depth and we'll distinguish between uniaxial minerals and biaxial minerals.